think we should do an episode talking about series that got canceled too soon that you should still watch even if you haven't started yet. I have such a long list for that one. <laughs> the answer is and always will be Firefly. Oh my god. Okay, okay. But that had an ending I... with the movie. That mm. one was capped with the movie. I never got into Firefly. As in you never saw it? No, I mean I saw it, but I never got the hype. Ooh, <laughs> right there to her heart. <laughs> Are you a fan of Nathan Fillion at all? I mean, yeah, I, I have nothing against a guy. Oh, that says it all. If you don't like Nathan Fillion, you don't like that show. No, I like that... Nathan Fillion. The <laughs> thing is, if you discovered him on Castle, you're like, oh, he's okay. But when you see younger Fillion, I mean, he came in as like a villain in the last series of Buffy, and he was brilliant. Oh, I see. See, that's the thing. I am a massive Buffy fan, and I really enjoyed him in Buffy as well. But I don't know. Like, I watched Firefly after Buffy, and yeah, did I don't know. Did you watch all of Firefly, or did you just watch the first one and go, eh? Hey. Think, I, I, I think I watched, like, nearly the entire series, and I've seen the movie. It was only because mm-hmm. when they released it originally, they didn't like the pilot and Fox being Fox showed the second episode first and then showed the pilot. I don't even know if they aired the pilot originally. The whole series was mixed up throughout the yeah, season. Yeah, they changed the order around every week and it was like, what are you doing? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I heard about that. But I th- when I it came, I think I saw it on Netflix, so it probably was in the right order. With oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, funnily enough, we are talking about shows being cancelled. That's actually what we're going to talk about when we start this podcast. Anyway, hey. now, the music. Hi and welcome to the We Need You Both podcast and since our raft of recent specials we might have missed a few shows over the last month or so. Firstly today I'm joined all the way from Florida by Mr. Jose Lopez. How's it going Jose? Greetings program. <laughs> Sorry. I... How many people have got that reference? Because not that many. I'm Let's try. Well okay maybe some. All the way from Portugal we have Marie from the Two Girls One Reusable Cups podcast. Happy to be back. And David can't be here, but he may, he may or may not be dropping in his thoughts later on the show we're going to be talking about. And if he doesn't, it's because he's covered in baby poop. And uh, Ben is on tour living a punk rock lifestyle, you know, just casually hanging out with the Foo Fighters, as you do. In today's episode, I'm going to be ranting about shows being cancelled, like My Lady Jane on Prime, Renegade Now on Disney+, and the sure to be cancelled, The Cameron on Netflix. And at uh, breaking news, Disney has literally just cancelled The Acolyte as well the day before we record this. Uh, although, if you listen to our previous episode, you'll know we are not upset by this news, but we also we are not to blame for it. Then, in our spoiler section, we are going to be taking one last trip to the subway with the final season of The Umbrella Academy and belatedly give you our thoughts on season two of House of the Dragon. First up, Amazon's anarchic period romance comedy fantasy, My Lady Jane, has been cancelled after seemingly just one well-received season, currently at 94% on the tomato meter with critics and a 78% audience score. It's sadly one and done, after only being out for six weeks. Now, the premise of this show was a fantastical retelling of the story of Lady Jane Grey, who was only queen for nine days and then beheaded. And as the very sweary voiceover tells us, fuck that, what if she didn't? Emily Bader plays a forthright titular character, and I was amazed to see that she was actually American, from New York. And because I hadn't heard of her before, and she absolutely nails the English accent spot on. Uh, The show's premise is that she is a cousin of the alien king, and when the king is presumed dead, she is manipulated into an arranged marriage she doesn't want, and a throne she doesn't want. Also, her maid in it, Jose, is only Jen from Extraordinary Married Tears. At one point, she turns into some, I think it's either like an owl or a hawk, and she just flies out of the building. And I was like, okay, so there's going to be magic in this show as well. Uh, there's a guy who turns into a horse, but only at night. It's a wild, wild show. And of course, it has a by now standard enemies to lovers trope, but also a cracking soundtrack of classic 70s rockets, but performed, if I'm right, by all modern female artists, which is a cool thing they seem to be doing. The show also stars Sex Education's Edward Blumel, who played Mabe's older brother, and he plays Jane's arranged marriage, uh, Lord Dudley. Anna Chancellor, who everyone should remember from Four Weddings and a Funeral, is superb as her scheming mother, Lady Frances. You've got Rob Brydon as the equally scheming older Lord Dudley, and a scene-stealing Kate O'Flynn as the quite mad Mary, who feels she should be on the throne. And we can't forget, you've got a lecherous Dominic Cooper as well. So, great cast, solid premise, Generally well received reviews. Jose, why do you think this hasn't found an audience? 
I know for me that it's, it's just hard to get to everything. Uh, there's so much that is good. Even like there's even great stuff that I just, I, I haven't had the time. And, and I know a lot of people are the same that we want to watch things and we know that we've heard good things, but we just can't get to it right away. And I guess streaming executives just were like, eh, we got some out of it. Now it's time to go on, move on. Marie, what do you think? To be honest, I think this is a marketing issue um, because I only watched this because Neil told me about it and I only heard about it because Neil told me about it. When it comes to marketing, I didn't see like a single trailer, a single poster, like a single like short on Instagram about this. And in today's like market, because there's so, 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 so much stuff, it is so important to have like a good marketing behind it. And we've seen this before with Lockwood and Co., where there was absolutely zero marketing. And then, of course, that also got canceled. And I do think it was because of the marketing, because that show is, was so, so good. He, like, even though it was really good, sh good show, I personally did not gel with the show as much as Neil did. Uh, did. And I'm personally not as upset with the cancellation <laughs> as much as Neil is. There's far, far more shows that I'm upset with. And I think the reason for that is that when it comes to young adult fiction, when it comes to enemies of, uh, to lovers, that thing is my bread and butter. I love it so, so much. I have consumed it in nearly every iteration whatsoever. And this one just, it didn't click for me. It was just a bit, I don't know, it just didn't work. There were some moments where it was great, but then some moments it just didn't work. And um, the like the Tudor setting, but with, a more modern eyes, more modern twist. We've seen this before as well. Um, another, like, it really reminded me of The Great, which um, is an amazing show that I watched this earlier this year, which if I haven't seen those two close together, maybe I would have gelled with this better. Uh, you mentioned the narration. I think the narration could have been a bit more ballsy. I think there were a few moments where the narration was like funny and real good, but at sometimes it was annoying. I think mm, yeah. a different narrator could have worked better as well. Uh, it just sounded too generic. I I do I do like it, and I think it could have worked, but it just needed a final polish. This show, bizarrely, would never be in my wheelhouse at all. Like it's not something you know, like I don't watch Bridgerton. I'd never watch Downton Abbey. I'm not like a a period guy. You know, I'm strictly you know not strictly, but. You know, it's usually going to be fantasy, sci-fi. You know, them they might go to genres, and yet I just wanted something funny to watch, like late night once. And I was like, I saw the trade, and bizarrely, I did see a trader for this on Amazon. I've whatever I've been watching on Amazon, and the trader for this popped up, and I was like, and it had that like harp version of Wild Thing. And I was like, and like say the the sweary voice. I was like, do you know what? I'm going to watch this, and I really like the show. I, I yeah, I don't think it is like high quality. I think it's like definitely like a a middling show, but I was entertained for it. And as it goes on, I like, I loved the sisters. I thought the sisters were brilliant, but the stroppy little one, who's just a schemer when she's like, oh, what about nine or 10, uh, the older ones, terrible attempts at like trying to, that reminded me actually of, um, Oh, what's the Disney plus show? Awful Dodger. She actually reminded me of the sister from Awful Dodger a little bit as well. And that same kind of like absolutely terrible love life in it. And it's like, that made me laugh. It just, yeah, uh, I think what put a lot of people off it because it made it was that, that big shift in the first one where, wait, people turn into animals in this, and I think you either go with it or you're like, nah, I'm out. And I think a lot of people see that and they are out. It wasn't a smooth transition. I know no. they were like going for shock value, but it I uh, because as a, like this this is my like like I love fantasy, um, like I love period dramas with a fantasy twist. But the like, yeah, when she suddenly turned into a bird, I was just like, oh, um, OK, yeah, I can roll with that. But um, I think when it comes to fantasy, what's important is world building. And in this, they, they established with the narration that it was a alternate history story um, with a modern twist that um, it also reminded me a bit of Six, the musical which is ironically about Henry VIII's wives as well. So it's uh, it's fitting. This could be a, a sequel to Six. But yeah, that sudden moment where like she turns into a bird and then the narration just goes, oh yeah, magic is real in this world. And like, that's not <laughs> good writing. That's not nah. good writing. No, you at least like have like, like because like Jane is like, 
very like scientific uh, like jane is like they picked her as smart like she's a herbalist she's into your medicines which is something that they do not carry through as well no uh mm, well they that's the thing like they, the whole not like other girls trope but it kind of falls to the side but like she could have like a sketch on her wall about like someone turning into an animal or something in the background where you're like oh this is uh, like out of blue because they mentioned the word ethians but they didn't like define it and didn't like no. say and they didn't have to say oh ethians are like basically people like animagus uh they turn into animals they didn't need to say that but just have like a little sketch or something in the background that's world building so is is this happening at the end of the first episode or is it like first 10 minutes yeah okay so uh, i could argue that within 10 minutes Animal changing is a good establishing moment. But I think that could also put people off the show within the first 10 minutes. Oh, you know? okay. Which could be why it might not have... Uh, and it, it'd be a weird thing, depending on Amazon's metrics. Like, it might be, oh, if someone watches the first 10 minutes of the show, it counts as the whole show in their metrics, mm. which could be really... And then the drop-off would probably be massively sheer after that. Okay. Uh, I think it... I mean, yeah, I, I it's not the best show, but I just I enjoyed it more than I thought I was going to. And I was like, okay, I'd like to have seen where a second series could have gone as well. When shows get cancelled these days, it's so increasingly unlikely that another network picks them up because they don't want to... It, it, it's more and more common now. If a show gets cancelled, that's it, sadly. I was about to say, even if you have a billboard in Times Square, a show still doesn't uh, get yeah. picked up. Save Our Flag Means Death. I mean, that's still the <laughs> one that hurts the most. Wait, what was that? What show? Our Flag Means Death, Jose. Yeah. We got, like, bill, bill, billboards and, like, airplanes, like, street, like, wow. we had, like, everything, the movement, like, they... I was saying, it's, it's the gay pirate show. It's so good. Oh, I didn't catch that one either. I'm sorry. Two seasons, Jose, two seasons. See, this is the <laughs> reason. Uh. <laughs> You're the reason, Jose. Oh, You're I'm sorry. You're the reason Black Means Death got cancelled. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, like that one hurts the most for me, but oh. like, and there the fan base was adamant for like months to try and get it back, and we had so much momentum. See, I didn't realize it had been outright cancelled. I just thought they planned for two seasons, and then that was it. It mm. did end with like yeah. possibility for more. Um, but I still wanted to have more. I wanted them to get married. I wanted a wedding. <laughs> I wanted a wedding and I wanted a Flight of the Concords cameo. And oh. it's just, we were robbed of that. Well, I might be mentioning a, a little bit of that in a minute. <laughs> Something coming I feel up. like the, the biggest thing that we have to realize, this is not like cable. Like you just reminded me of Brooklyn Nine-Nine. They ended their, like, I think eighth season with a wedding. And they're like, you know, I guess we're going to be done. And then they came back with one more season. Mm. And it, it, it's it's arguably pretty good. but um. It, but it's, also, it, think... the problem with that, the pro sorry, Jose, to interrupt, but the problem with that last season was it was shot right as COVID was happening. And yeah, so yeah, half yeah. of people couldn't even be in it. You could clearly tell when you was watching it, it was done at the peak of it because people were just not in the same spaces when they were acting. Yeah. And also they said they weren't even sure they wanted to come back after all the police brutality stuff that had been happening as well. Oh, that, that's a whole story. And it's like how do, they, they, was, they was like, how do we do a, a comedy about police when everyone hates the police at the minute? Yeah, but think about it. Despite all of that, because it was on a network, it was able to come back. And all these other shows that are great, granted, maybe not as great as Brooklyn Nine-Nine because I hold that show in high esteem. I feel like streaming services are just like throwing these shows away, even worse than Fox has with their shows. Fucking Fox. Save Firefly. Uh, well, and yeah, always Firefly. Ah, oh, too soon. <laughs> too soon <laughs> i mean it's about 20 years now but still too soon and uh while i'm getting angry about fantasy period shows being cancelled disney plus you absolute mothers have also cancelled renegade now which was another similarly themed period fantasy show that starred louisa harland from Derry girls and she played a outlaw well uh, yeah an outlaw called now who is on the run to clear her name when she's accused of murder. Oh, and Nate from Ted Lasso is in it. Nick Muhammad playing a magical fairy who goes into... No, there's got to be a better way of saying that. Uh, uh, gives her superpowers, <laughs> but only when he feels like it. And the surprise for me is this was written by a lady called Sally Wainwright, who is known in the UK for doing a show called Happy Valley, which was one of the best UK crime dramas of the last decade. So surely Disney would want to keep her around for her next project. But then why would she when they literally cancelled it? And again, this had a... It had that kind of fantasy. It had the comedy. It had the period setting. 
And it just, it was especially galling because they really thought a second series was on the way. The writers were actively writing it. And then the cancellation news just dropped on that. Does anyone else hear this in Renegade now? No. no. You did recommend it to me, but I haven't gone around to it. And once again, the only reason I know of its existence <laughs> is because of you. It's you, Marie. You didn't watch it. And so now they had to cancel it. <laughs> there was actually buses with uh, posters for My Lady Jane on it in the UK. Because I remember seeing them when driving to work. Hmm. So they did promote it over here. But I guess not enough people watched it. Anything else you guys have been watching in a minute, other than what we're going to be talking about? Jose, what have you been watching? I did finally watch a movie that's been out for a long time, but uh, Promising Young Woman. Uh, Amazing. Oh, that yeah. is a wonderful movie. I've, I've just had it in my to-do list for far too long. I love the trailer, and it's it delivers. It just yeah. delivers so well. I will say, Jose, if you like that, and it sounds like you did, go and check out Emerald Fennell's next film, Saltburn. Do not check out Saltburn. Do not <laughs> check out. Do no fuck no. I fucking hate Saltburn. I am traumatized from Saltburn. Uh, Saltburn. Do not take baths was... anymore. I, I heard something about a bathtub, and I'm like, okay, gotta get ready. Saltburn is like what I thought Promising Young Woman was would have been and like it's um because I really do like Promising Young Woman mm. I really I enjoyed that at that I did not see it um in cinema even though it was premiering at the uh Dublin Film Festival I think it's used to be called the Jemison Film F Festival now it's something else but uh, I didn't because it looked like torture porn to me Oh. And um, because it's like the trailers were like pretty menacing and it just like it even like... the movie itself kind of halfway through. You're just like, what? What is she well, doing? Some of the some of the original posters for it were amazing. I was really annoyed because it, it's not got a 4K release. It's only had like a basic Blu-ray release. And the mm. poster artwork for it was so the DVD cases was so crap for it. And you saw these amazing posters that came out originally. I was like, why is that not the cover? Mm -hmm. yeah but yeah i really but i really liked it because it's like it completely was the opposite of what i thought it was so i thought saltburn <laughs> would be the same and oh my god i regretted all my life decisions when i watched that movie i yeah i hate really it. really hated it by the sounds I of things really fucking hate saltburn i just it was wow. nonsensical there wasn't a point to it it was just ah uh, it just shock for shock value sake i know i and i'm traumatized <laughs> So, so, Jose, you have a choice now. <laughs> <laughs> I think I might have a couple drinks before watching Saltburn, just to be safe. Just don't drink bath water. That's all I'm saying. Oh, don't no. drink bath water. No. Uh, Marie, what have you been watching recently? Not much, but I did watch the third season of Abbott Elementary. Uh, okay. Which, oh. uh, I, I generally really liked. Um, Ab although, like, one thing about Abbott, I think it's, like, the opposite of a binging show. Like, I feel like I watch one episode and I'm like, okay, I can wait till tomorrow. Uh, because uh, if you haven't seen it yet, it takes place at, at an elementary school in Philadelphia. And it's a, like, similar to Parks and Recs and The Office, mm. uh, mockumentary style following the teachers around for this school. Uh, and... It it is really really funny and I do like the uh, like there it, it has some amazing writing and amazing moments, um and I did really like season three as well. It's just I, it's I think the perfect like casual viewing show. Like I wouldn't like when it comes to like that mockumentary style. I still think like Parks and Rec still the absolute yeah. best, um, uh -huh. but. I think it is still a very cute show. And if you like those types of shows, I would recommend it. I see. I watched the first few episodes and liked it. And then I forget because it's all on Disney Plus now. But yeah. I watched it when it and it wasn't, I think. Or So I need to go back to it, I think. It's funny. So I think we may have to do our top 10 Parks and Rec episodes at some point. <gasps> yes. I love talking uh, about that, Parks and Rec. Parks and Rec <laughs> is my all time favorite sitcom. It is I, just oh, wow. so good. Wow. I put it above friends. I put it above community. Uh, community would be a strong number two, but it yeah. didn't have the gas leak season. Uh, oh, yeah. And Parks and Rec <laughs> just got better and better every season. So much so that its last season was basically a victory lap season that wasn't even they, they weren't even supposed to have. It's mm -hmm. like, do you want to do one more? And it's like, okay. And it was it was just like every episode nice. was just but this is in the Parks and Rec one. But I guess we're gonna be doing one at some point soon. <laughs> oh yeah. Now I'm gonna have to that. argue for Park Brooklyn nine nine. That's... Brooklyn Nine Nine is very good, Jose, but I think the weekend yeah. last season wasn't needed. Whereas not, Parks and Rec last season that. was amazing. But okay, have, have I said my issue with Brooklyn Nine 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 before? No. no. Oh okay. my god, now I'm scared. <laughs> no, I might. The issue I might is... not like you after this. 
Andy Samberg looks lo- exactly like my brother, and it freaks the <laughs> freaks the fuck out of me. So I cannot watch it. <laughs> so it's anything with Andy Samberg in? It's anything. It's on. Uncan- oh, okay. Speaking of Parks and Rec, like he never saw it, and then we watched it in COVID, and then we watched the episode where Andy Samberg uh, like does like yeah. cameos, and I'm just like. <laughs> so is like, is your brother dude. not funny? Is that why you don't think it, he, is it is it just weird? It's it's just weird because they they share the same mannerisms and facial oh, expressions wow. and um you, like especially when he had curly hair like when he like was on SNL yeah. and had that big curly hair that was the identical haircut as my brother and some That's... facial expressions I'm like nearly probably the only one like. <laughs> like I, I like pointed this out to his girlfriend and she didn't get it, but I'm like, it, it's uncanny. I it just freaks me out. <laughs> I, I feel like this isn't gonna affect your enjoyment of Brooklyn Nine Nine, Jose. I think you're okay still. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is a very this feel- unique problem to me. <laughs> this is a more, uh, this is a Marie issue here, not ours. <laughs> it's a fun tidbit to know. I'll just send her Brooklyn Nine Nine memes randomly to scare her. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Marie, there's a show that I'm gonna recommend to you now. That is written by and stars and is directed by Takawa Titi and Jermaine Clement that has just dropped on Apple. I really do need to get on Apple because I completely ignore it. Oh my God, you have so many good shows on Apple. We I'm are sorry. actually going to do a top 10 Apple shows of all time yes. pod soon as well because there's so much good stuff. But that show is Time Bandits, a new take on the classic 80s film that I've never seen, which uh, I think it was uh, Terry Gilliam, wasn't it? Or the Monty Python guys did it. But this mm. is a new version of the story split over 10 episodes. And uh, the leader of the Time Bandits in this one is Lisa Kudrow. Basically playing Lisa Kudrow. And she is amazing in it. But better than that, the main kid in it, Kevin Haddock, which is a brilliant name, who gets taken off on the, the journey with them, is in, played improbably. He's played by a kid who his real name is the most improbable name you'll ever hear. This kid's parents were big Superman fans. Because they kid, called their kid Kal El. Oh no! Not <laughs> not Clark Kent. Kal El. Kal El, and his surname is Tuck, so it's Kal El Tuck, and he's from up north in England. So he's got a brilliant northern accent, and this kid is amazing. He is so funny. He was only I think eleven or twelve when he made this show, and also in the show, Watiti himself plays the supreme being. Because of course he'd cast himself as a supreme being, but he gets to wear jazzy white suits and shoot thunder from his hands. So I'm definitely thinking he's like when he was working on four, he's like, I want to do a bit of that. That looks like fun. So he's kind of channeling in his inner four in this. And of course, Jermaine Clement gets to play the baddie, pure evil, which is the name of the baddie. And uh, they both look like they're having a ton of fun in this. And this show, it might skew a little younger. It's like, but if you want a show that educates you about history. Like, that's what I love is the kid is just mm-hmm. unpopular when the show starts because he's into history and ancient times and stuff. And he's always telling people about stuff and no one cares. And then he goes to all the actual places and it's just really fun. It's a really fun, easy watch. It's really family friendly. And it's great to hear a new cast doing kind of Takawa Titi's dialogue. But Marie, it sadly really does remind me of Our Flag Means Death when you've got the gang of bandits. And even there's one like big um, Scandinavian dude and he just looks like one of the pirates and like, so, uh, yeah, virtually Jose passed Maria Tissue for this one. Because when you watch it, you're going to be like, I like it, but I probably don't enjoy it as much as Our Flag Means Death. Save Our Flag Means Death. <laughs> you have to watch Time Badges now before it gets taken off and cancelled. No, this is Apple. Apple generally don't cancel shows, even bad uh... ones. Because how the hell did the morning show get a second, a third series? Third after series? The second series. Yeah, I was surprised. After the second one. Season like, one, right. amazing. Season two, drove off a cliff, literally. I mean, after and, uh, you're liking Taiga Watiti, there's an amazing pirate show with a big fan base that you could pick up. Right. <laughs> Honestly, Taika Watiti is a negative for me. <gasps> no, no, Jose, go back. It's going back the other way now. He's getting on no. my nerves. Look, just because he cast himself as a supreme being doesn't mean he's all about his ego. I'm I'm a Marvel boy, and he burned me with Marvel with the okay. Thor. Okay, I Love have and to Thunder. admit, Lo- Thor and Love of Thunder was absolute shite. But I still do really like Taiga Watiti. Yeah. Like I know he's his his track record's pretty solid. Like obviously. I like oh. his films. Like yeah, exactly. Yeah. Come on, even his most recent one, uh, Next Goal Wins, was fun. It was, I mean, and it got panned. Yeah, like, which I don't know why. I don't understand. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. I wrote because you know, I saw a preview of it. Wrote a really, really nice tweet out about the film, and then we got followed by the real life Thomas Rongen, the coach from the film. 
What? Because he was because we yeah we got a preview over here like about a week before it went on general. So obviously he was like looking for anything, and yeah, he follows our podcast Twitter now. Which, That's awesome. You know, Awesome, right? Yeah. One other thing I would say is HBO are also making the very unwanted and unnecessary Harry Potter remake. But if you need a new Harry Potter, this is the kid. Because at 12, he is already a much better actor than Radcliffe ever was. He is so good in this show. He's got the long floppy hair. Yeah, no, honestly, he's got the long floppy hair. He wears glasses. And I was just like, this kid, he's got it, man. He is such a better actor than Radcliffe was at the same age. And... um. That's who you go with, man. This is the kid. I honestly, I'm calling it now. If it happens, I'll be, I'll just be like smug, but you know, not much else. Uh, Jose, another show that's dropped on Apple about the same time that you have to watch. I definitely want to watch Vaughan's this one. new show, Bad Monkey. And it's Vaughn doing his best 2000s Vaughning. You know, when he was like the fast talking guy and oh, great. a he's million great. jokes a minute. This is what he's like in a show. But it's a new show from Bill Lawrence of Ted Lasso, Scrubs and Shrinking Fame. Mm-hmm. And it's set in the Florida Keys. So, you know, your neck of the woods, not quite, but, you know, same state. I, I've been there once. I, okay, so, but I believe this is required watching for you now, Jose. It's I a guess, crime yeah. comedy caper. And it's also another really easy watch with episodes from, you know, 35 minutes to 45. Uh, and indeed, there is a parallel storyline that's going. There's two storylines going on at the minute. And there's a monkey in the show as well. But it hasn't been bad yet. But, you know, it's going to be. Mm. One other thing I've watched recently as well. Again, I wanted just a late night show to watch. Something that didn't tax my brain. And I saw Unstable on Netflix, Rob Lowe's new show. And I think it's from some of the people who worked on Parks and Rec. And um, I ended up binging the first season in three days. And it's not the best show ever. He plays an emotionally unstable scientist coping badly from the recent death of his wife. And to save the company and get it back on track, his tireless assistant, Anna, who is played brilliantly by Sean Clifford, who is Fleabag's sister, so she's the only English person in the show, and she's so British in the show. She's so acerbic and just cutting on everyone. And her idea is, well, look, he needs to get. We need to get his son back, and he's played by Rob Lowe's actual son, who's I don't think he's acted in stuff before. So it's weird seeing them both on screen. It's like young, old, young, old. And the idea is to get him in, and then there's some really funny scientist characters, a lot of science jokes, and he's trying to do the sustainability things to invent a uh, stuff from carbon that will stop greenhouse gases. He basically thinks if his new product he makes works, then they will save greenhouse gases. Uh, they will like save the planet, basically. So it's all about saving the planet as well. Oh, okay. So now, now it sounds extremely up my alley. Yeah. Yes. I mean, Rob Lowe is basically just playing a version of himself and also Chris Traeger. In fact, there's a guy in our office called Chris, and he does remind me of Chris Traeger, and no one gets a reference. So I was like, Chris, and he's like, yeah, but no one gets it. He does so much acti- he does so much cycling and activities. This guy in the office, I'm like, how do you not know you are a real life Chris Traeger? But yeah, it's it's lots of science jokes, cast are great, and the second series just dropped. But it's, again, it's Netflix, so it's only eight episodes, mm. not twenty two. But I'm enjoying it, and now probably watch a few of those tonight. The last show I'm going to talk about before we get into our spoiler section is a show that will probably be cancelled before I've even finished the sentence because it's yet another Today. period show. And it's on Netflix it's of all canceled. places. <laughs> oh, is it? Oh, let's not bother him. Uh, no, the show is called <laughs> The Decameron, a medieval black play comedy created by Kathleen Jordan, which was inspired by the 14th century Italian short story collection of the same name. And the premise is, in 1348, just as the Black Death ravages Florence, a group of nobles and their servants retreat to the countryside of Villa Santa. As they attempt to wait out the plague in the hills of Tuscany, they have a lot of wine, they have a lot of sex, and they eventually must fight for their survival amongst each other and outward forces. Now, again, this show has a really good cast. It's got Tony Hale, who plays Buster from Arrested Development in it, playing an Italian, but not doing the accent. So he's just American in it, which is weird and throws me off. Tanya Reynolds from Sex Education in it is one of the plays Lashia, one of the main characters. She's awesome. Amar Chadra Patel, uh, he was the dude in Willow as well. He was brilliant in Willow. He's in this. Uh, You've got Layla Fassard, Lou Gala, Shersha Monica Jackson from Derry Girls is also in this. Oh, it's not going well for Derry Girls in fantasy shows and period things. But um, she's in this playing uh, thing. And you've got Zosa Mamet from Girls in this as well, who I'd never seen in anything before. So, look, I was a really big fan of Tanya Reynolds because she played Lily in Sex Education. And I have to mention, yes, I saw her on stage in a mirror in January this year. And she was amazing. Like I said, you've got Erin from Derry Girls. You've got Buster from Rest of Development. These are great comedy actors. But the show doesn't work, despite some great moments and performances. Most notably because the show's tone is all over the place. It begins as a medieval, almost slapstick sex comedy. 
and then gets darker and darker as the survivors as the survivors kind of turn on each other and then they face new threats and resources dwindle and all the cast speak english which is fine if everyone does it without trying horrible italian accents <laughs> except the two of the class are clearly american uh mamet's character and her she's so american it just really takes me out of the show and um, you've got a French character. It's never explained why she's French. She just is. She could be French, but it's not really explained in the show. Uh, so it kind of, it just, it, uh, that took me out of the show. And all the episodes are way too long for a high concept comedy. The episode should be, you know, half hour, 40 minutes tops, not an hour long. And it's a shame because there's a good show trapped here under the fat of its tonal unevenness. Uh, like the problem in later in episodes when it tries to be serious and it faced with life and death situations is that we don't really care about the characters enough from earlier on to care for it to matter when they are in these situations. You're like, oh, kill him. I don't care. I will do a minor spoiler from the first episode. There's a character, Philomena, played by Jessica Plummer, and she's a rich noble. And her servant, the Shia, is played by Tanya Reynolds. And they have an argument on the way to the villa, which results in the Shia pushing her off a bridge to her apparent death. And then she turns up at the villa and pretends to impersonate her. I was like, great, that's a hook for me. That's a really good hook for a series. And that kept me watching despite some really annoying other characters. So there's a guy called Dougie McKean, who I've never heard of before, plays a character called Tindero, who's a wealthy hypochondriac, and who the pilot TV podcast rightly termed a much more annoying British Seth Rogen. And honestly, this guy annoyed the piss out of me, but not as much as Zoza Mamet's character, a spoiled noble who's just supposed to be getting married to the owner of the villa. Although I think maybe in her case, she's supposed to be outrightly hated by everyone. Definitely the other characters and especially us, the viewers. But as I just mentioned, her accent just pulls you out of the show every time. I think my favourite character in the show has to be uh, her servant, Miss Ma, played by Derry Girl's Saoirse Monica Jacksons, because she has a really dark storyline from the start of the show. And it just gets darker and darker as the show goes on. And I, she gives a really superb performance here. And again, just as Reynolds trying to blend in as an old woman. But out of the three shows we've mentioned today that have been cancelled, and, well, other ones as well, this is probably my least favourite due to the uneven tone. Really misjudged needle drops. It, again, it tries doing that modern music in a period setting thing. But it just picks the most on-the-nose songs so much so that I can't even remember them. And it has a really, some of just the annoying characters in it. Uh, it. Honestly, the eight episodes, it made it feel like a slog to get through it all, but I persevered and watched them all. And yet, ironically, this show probably has the most definitive ending of any of them, and yet it hasn't been cancelled by Netflix yet. And in a shock wow. twist, the show's, the show's creator has jokingly said she even has ideas for a second season. She's like, anything is possible. I love the characters on the show. I also think there is a version in the future that's more of an anthology where we just take this cast and drop them into different periods of disease around the world why 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 don't we drop them in as actors in 16th century france next for a touch of syphilis we can never run out of diseases that's not the picture i really want for a show that's going to make me watch another season mm. i i don't feel like i've solved this toy review either right no not really <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> well as we said it's a period show so it's probably going to be cancelled soon anyway oh. that brings us to our spoiler section friends romans TV watchers, spoilers ahead. And first up, I'm getting eyebrows from people already because hey, we know we're going to be talking the Umbrella Academy's fourth and final season, which has just dropped on Netflix. We've only six episodes to finish off the one the show once and for all. And honestly, this is a show that I watch each season in a binge and then completely forget about between seasons. So much so that I can barely remember what happened in the last season or who most, most of the characters are. And yet the show's always been entertaining when I've watched it. Jose, how much of a fan of this show are you? So I am actually quite a, I'd say a good fan of this show. I enjoyed the first two seasons quite a lot. And then the third season, I feel like just got a little off the rails. Okay. But then I was under the impression that these six episodes was like a mid season break. Cause I, I, I don't, Marie, I didn't tell you this, but I told Neil right before we started recording I couldn't finish the sixth episode, but I was like, oh, I mean, this is just a weird way. You know, I'd rather just see this go like longer. And then I'm like, and Neil tells me, yeah, this is it. This is done. And I'm like, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> There's no real good setup. And I think we're going to talk about it fully more. But this this last season, if they end, they end it on the sixth episode, I've gotten through five. It's going to be a harsh ride. It's just like. Ugh. 
Well, we'll be interested yeah. to find out your opinion in a minute, Jose, when but, we but spoil before it for this, you. Before the season, I was a fan. Like, even after that weird third season, I was like, okay, let's keep going. I want to see where this goes. Do you know what it had for me? It had that thing of every time Netflix have a successful show, they reduce the budget each season until they finish it rather than increase it. That that was very noticeable in this season. Yeah. It just was really just so different than before. So, Marie, how big a fan of the show are you? I'm a massive fan. I honestly really love this show. And uh, I, I have to admit, season one was the highlight. But I did love the following two seasons, uh, even season three. Um, I thought it was funny. I thought it was witty. I I do remember the characters. Um, I thought they do a good job with the characters, even though it's such a big cast. Each season has a standout moment, uh, which um, there's always like there's so many like quotes from the like few, uh, first three seasons that I like. I really love love, and none of that was in the final season. And what it honestly, I just. Oh, Biff, before oh. you go into a rant, which I know you've prepared, oh, yeah. let me just set up what the fourth season is. Because, uh, again, from someone who just forgets what the show is between seasons, <laughs> season four once again sees us with a soft reboot of the show. And all you really need to know going into the season is that, once again, our main characters are stuck in an alternate timeline at the end of season three. They've lost all their powers, and we are now six years down the line, and they've just more or less decided to give up and make the most of the situation, despite their villainous father, Reginald Hargreaves, being alive and even more powerful in his timeline. Luther is hilariously working as a bad stripper. Alison is an actress, but in bad commercials. Klaus lives in Alison's basement, is sober and a germaphobe. Victor owns a bar in Nova Scotia. Ben is just out of prison for a Cripsco scam. Diego is a delivery driver with a dodgy tash, but also three kids with Lila. And five, of course, still works as an agent, this time for the CIA. And this time, our baddies, such as they are, are only Ron and Tammy from Parks and Rec. Yeah, Nick Overman and Megan Milani play Gene and G, one with a G, one with a J, who have formed a cult group called The Keepers, who believe they are living in a different timeline, and, well, they are right, and that they and their members have recollections of, and they are finding artefacts of different timelines. A board with suburban life, Lila has been going to secret meetings with five off the keepers to try and find out more. Not really much else happened in that first episode, except they all get together and a small vial of marigold, which is the substance that gives them their powers. And they decide not to take it because they're mostly happy with their average lives. But Ben, being a douchebag, in a move, telegraphed miles away, the second you see him being a douchebag and the vial, spikes their drinks with marigold. And the first episode ends with them getting their powers back. Marie, unleash. See, all of that, what you just described, sounds so fucking awesome. Like, if you hear that premise, you're like, oh my God, we're off to a great season. And I genuinely really did enjoy uh, the first episode. Yeah, I loved same. Luther as a yeah, stripper. Yeah. I laughed my ass off. Klaus being a germaphobe hypochondriac, brilliant, because now he can die. I liked seeing all of the other ones also. Like, uh, it made sense where they ended up. I, I have a big issue. I do have an issue with time skips. I don't know if I ranted yeah, about this before. No. Uh, I don't like time skips in shows. I do think that's lazy writing. In this case, it did kind of make sense. Uh, uh, sense, And it, it was great. And you could still see that they're a family because they got together for one of the children's birthdays. And they you could see that, um, once again, the classic heart grieves, like, children, like, just, um, what's the word? Uh, Pickering? bickering exactly starts and it, it it was off like to such a great start and then season and then episode two was also really good i really did enjoy episode two and them getting back their powers uh, powers but that's where things started to get a little like i'd say personally three and four and five is where it just slowly kept declining even yeah, more. i agree and i know where the minute it started declining because like Ooh. i just like like pulled up the episodes right now just to remind myself of the disappointment and the description of episode three starts with uh with the hargreaves kids split up that's when it went wrong when they fucking split them up this show yes. Yes. is all about being a family and they've been split and put together so many times and for the last hurrah i just wanted them to be together i just wanted them to like play off each other and have fun and all that what we got in the first two episodes and why the fuck did they split them up i agree 
I could go on, but I'll, I'm getting. I'll letting you guys chime in. No, here. I agree. the The first two episodes were solid because of the bickering and, and together. the interactions, yeah. and and I thought, if anything, uh, the the character Ben, I'm like, okay, so he's gonna go after the girl, and yet everyone else is like, oh no, we're just gonna go for our dad. I'm like, really? Only Ben is gonna go after the girl who is kind of crucial still. It just there there were so many just illogical ideas i did that... not care about ben and jen at all i was like what i just i there was so i mean jen literally had no character development whatsoever it's like oh yeah this is the girl who's gonna she's oh she owns know, a diner Mac she's interesting Macguff mcguffin girl that's it that's literally mcguffin the only girl in a squid yeah. why the fuck was she in a squid what yeah. that was never explained okay the... so it never got explained that's the second half of the season jose <laughs> Umbrella uh, Academy man. is wacky and zany, but every time something happens, there is at least a little bit of an explanation, a little bit of an exposition dump. Mm -hmm. Absolutely no explanation why she was in a squid. <laughs> well, also, That's, there was hardly yeah. any mention as well of the Sparrow Academy from season three. Luther lost his wife in the last series, and I, I think there's one brief mention of the Sparrow yeah. Academy. That's it. No, they moved mentioned... on. It's when they went to a different dimension, and it was the Phoenix Academy. Instead. Yeah, but Luther mentions his wife in like one comment, yeah. and, that's and that's it. it. Like, and I remember, I remember, I vaguely remember that from season three. Going, oh yeah, that was really, that was a really nice relationship. We were, they played together well, was, and it was good. And then, no, just move on. And uh, like course, Ben, like mentions that his family's dead. So like, like that's what it's again an interesting dynamic because it's not their Ben. It's not yeah. their bed, and um, his mm -hmm. family is dead, and he doesn't actually even know these new people. Uh, people at this point, it has been six years, but he's been locked up for most of it. Uh, but they, because they lost their bed, feel like a sense of loyalty to him. Again, that makes sense, but it just it wasn't developed. It didn't come no. together. I think the most egregious part of the season that the fans just absolutely lost their shit over was what were they thinking when? They put five and Lila together. Yeah, I was just like, where did that come from? Like, Jose, I understand... back away, back away. Marie looks like she's about to explode. Ooh. Go for there it. Go. I, I, yeah. I have no words. Like, what the fuck? No, it made zero sense. Like, they kind of had like a bit of like chemistry when they first meet, but it just, it just the context of it that five is a at this point, I don't know, sixty year old man in a twenty year old's body. No, absolutely not. She's married and has kids. And I just, I I don't, like, I didn't understand it. And it's, I, I think I've ranted about this before as well. Like putting unnecessary romance in places where it doesn't belong. We didn't need another love story. We wanted sibling love. We didn't want whatever that was. Cheating. Well, here's the weird thing about that, right? This storyline was done exactly the same, but much better in one episode. Marie, do you ever remember a show called The Magicians? No. Oh, seek it out. It's three seasons, and it is high... It basically, it's like Harry Potter for adults. So there's lots of sex, violence, and horrible demons in it. And it season one is kind of a bit all over the place, and then it becomes awesome. You should explain what the tie-in is, Neil. <laughs> I'm getting there. So Sorry. in the show, in season three, there was an episode called Life in a Day, where two of the main characters, Quinn and Elliot, get stranded in a different reality. And they're trying to find their way home. Sound familiar? But uh, they get stranded in this place and they just give up. They start making a life for themselves. They actually had their two male characters and they actually had a threesome with a girl in the first season. And it's never really hinted at again, but there's always kind of this attraction between the two guys, but he's hooked up with one of the, like the main girls, but it's always kind of simmering there in the background. When they get to this place and they're stuck, he there, uh, Elliot then marries a local girl. Quinn marries the girl, uh, but Quinn and Elliot, then when one of the, when their wife dies, they then raise the girl together and grow old together. And right as they're there on their deathbeds, like this magical thing happens and they go, oh yeah, you've completed the task. This was what it was to live a life in, you know, basically you completed it by living a good life. And then they get sucked back to where they were at the start of the episode, but with the whole memory of the life they lived. And it's honestly, it's one of the best, you know, like you only watch a show and there's that one episode you're like, that's the Emmy episode right there. 
that was this episode of the show the magicians and they did it because of good writing in one episode they made you believe these people got together and showed you the whole issue they did it in uh, the last of us with uh, the bill and frank episode yes also i should mention uh brick and morty kind of did a play on this as well in one of their episodes but i don't think it was as emotional <laughs> It wasn't, but it's a it's a good commentary that I'm a Rick and Morty fan, so. <laughs> but 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 also now that's another show for Marie to watch called The Magicians. I think it's on Prime. No, yeah, I heard. I've heard very good things about that show. I've so. read the books. I watched the show and then went and read the books. And there are talking magical animals in this, but they're really funny. And the show didn't get cancelled. It actually finished its run, if I believe, if I believe right, four, oh. three or four seasons. Uh, so yeah, now look, if they'd had the balls to do that with Five and Lila, then maybe we could have bought their yeah. romance. But the problem was, and the reason they didn't do that is they would have had to do the full episode just on them two. And with only six episodes, there was no way they were ever going to focus on just two characters for a whole episode. Do you know what? Agents of Shield did the exact same thing back in the day, where a character on in a real they won't know relationship, there was a two scientist characters, Fitz and Simmons, and then one of them gets trapped on an alien planet. And basically lives out a whole life there with someone else before she gets rescued. He comes back to her home. So that it has been done so many times. Futurama. Yeah, there you go. Did that too, but it was unnecessary. And that, but also like as you said, the it wouldn't it wouldn't have worked. Whatever how they would have spun it. It's just the relationship itself is so wrong because all we see from this interaction is just them on the subway, just them like that's it. like, and that's it. And we just see text flying back and again lazy writing that's not how you tell a story that's not yes you see them sleeping next to each other but that's it like there's it's... even dialogue of oh there's some of these worlds that we barely survived didn't yeah, see that don't well, see would it, have loved to fucking see that yeah. yeah yeah exactly would have loved to see that where, where she was like telling diego oh we we were running for our lives i'm like all we saw was you on that fucking train yeah. also did they ever explain the book and and the map that they got in the subways. Uh, I mean, they never or explained did... the subway. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, seriously? Yep. Press. But I, I am gonna. There's a couple of pros because we have been quite down it so far. I enjoyed Lila's laser eyes, although it did that feel very Homelander esque in the way. Did they come did... back in the sixth episode? Kinda. Her laser eyes. Can yeah, I, they do, um... kind of. We'll, we'll so... tell you about this. Actually, we could get through this without spoiling. Oh, well, we are going to have to spoil it. No, no, we have it. to. We have to talk yeah. about the stand. ending. I think the single best line in the whole series was, I'm sorry you left Canada for this, as Alison <laughs> says it to Victor. Or in reality, <laughs> she just says this to Elliot Page. Because like, yeah, I'm sorry you come back. We're massively underserved in this season. Why did Victor even end up with Hargreaves again? I can't care or remember. But I mean, but it, it just it made sense. Out of the entire cast, and all the plot points. Victor was the only one who was actually doing shit. That was the only plot point that actually fucking mattered. All the other ones were yeah. like like twiddling their thumbs. And Victor, if you like look at the entire plot from start to finish, Victor is the only one who contributed to the plot. The mm -hmm. only one. Yeah, there's a whole side quest that Luther and Diego went to be distracted at the oh. FBI or the CIA. Oh, that was so like, stupid. Why do they need to be? Um, yeah. It's, you know yeah. what? It, I think it really comes down to the writing. They didn't know what to do with these characters. Did a script get lost? Did they lose? Exactly. Did they lose? Did four episodes seven, get eight? lost? <laughs> <laughs> Just shuffled them around. We'll cut out all the bits that actually makes it worthwhile. I did enjoy Gene and Gene, though. And uh, I of mean, course. they were great. And they're great. Also, actors. seeing a serious David Cross in the first I know. Couple of episodes. I almost didn't take him seriously, but I'm like, okay. He, mate, he's always going to be Tobias from Arrested Development for me. Always. <laughs> I can see that, yes. We get on to the music. The music choices are also usually one of the standout aspects of the show. And episode one starts strong with the bad touch. I was like, yes, brilliant new sort of song. Yeah. However, once we got to fuck knows how many times we heard Baby Shark. Oh, that oh, I actually kind no. of enjoyed that. I really No Jose. Ah, no. That was great. No, I mean what they what they thought they were doing was they're gonna play it so long that you get no fucking stop it. But then it's gonna become funny again. No, fucking stop no. it. It I made agree. me want to throw my TV out of the window. I agree. And it's it, it's the general like comedy rule. It's the rule of three. You do it three times and then you stop. And they just kept doing it, doing <laughs> it, doing it. And it's just So oh. they pulled the Taika Watiti. Stop it, Jose. <laughs> Your hate for Watiti is unfounded. Um, we're about to throw in, down here <laughs> yeah it's, it's getting it's getting, getting feisty uh, we had shares, gypsies, tramps and thieves that was used very well in episode 3 with that really nice Gene and Gene dance sequence 
episodes five and six were pretty much nondescript for me. Although mm-hmm. it does make sense to have and to end the show. They end the show with the original version of We Think We're Alone Now, which obviously makes sense. It makes sense. And then the mid credits, Talking Heads, This Is The Place. I mean, uh. mm. so Jose, this is the ending. They all basically decide that the only way to save the world is to erase themselves from existence and just let the cleanse happen. And this feels like such a cop-out because every season of the show, they're in a situation where the whole world or reality is going to end. And what makes this one different? That they're just going to stop it. And I know it's, oh, well, if we don't exist, then this doesn't cause this. But I just didn't buy it. And as fans of the show, that is you're ending cop it. Out. Do you, yeah. Do you really want that? Oh, we never existed. or And it was all a kind of dreamer, you know. So he kind of goes back and you see the, the shots of their parents all sitting, standing around, which you have flashbacks through the season of it. That's what Victor sees, I think, early on. And it just feels so by the numbers and a cop out for the show to go in such a way. Um, I don't know the comics, though. And was this a comics? I'm guessing this wasn't a comics accurate ending or was it? Do we know? I don't, I don't know. know. I'm not a fan of uh, I'm not a fan of the comics either. So I do not right. know. Um, so if you if you know, drop us a message and let, let us know. know. Uh, but oh, I man. mean, I have no problem with a show ending with the protagonist dying. Yeah. Um, I, Angel did it really well. Angel did it really well. And to be honest, if Buffy ended it that way as well, I would have been happy. The only reason I kept watching Buffy because I heard that her and Spike get together. Otherwise, I literally watched, what was it? Season end, five. Season yeah. five. I literally watched season five and put Buffy aside for like two years because that was a great finale. I really like that ending. I have no problem with them killing off the main characters, but it needs to be earned. And it needs she to be She saved the world a lot. Exactly. It needs to be earned. It needs to be deserved. And it needs to make fucking sense. And it was neither of them. Having them fucking apart for the entire season and then bringing them together for this emotional like moment for a goodbye it wasn't earned because we didn't see them together we didn't see them interact and build relationships it just didn't work work then having them be consumed by big blobby goo just just didn't look great either the rationale also did not work the subway was never explained and and I never, I don't understand the logic of putting their families in the subway, because if they're erasing all timelines, like then the passage between timelines wouldn't exist either. So they would disappear as well. That just doesn't make sense. And then, like my final point, Loki did it way fucking better. And I think that's where we end yes. it. Loki did it better. Loki did it better. So. Moving on, the last thing we're going to talk about on today's episode, it's been around 84 years since season one of HBO's Game of Thrones prequel, House of the Dragons. And now we're going to talk about House of the Dragons season two. Uh, Here is a brief reminder from Wikipedia, because I've been lazy, of what happened in the series one (laughs) finale. Princess Rhaenyra arrives at Dragonstone from King's Landing to deliver the news of King Viserys' death. Rhaenyra is subsequently crowned Queen of the Seven Kingdoms and opposes her faction's demands for open war, instead wanting to secure alliances. Her son, Lucheris, is sent to Storm's End to gain Baratheon support for Rhaenyra's cause. At Storm's End, Lucheris meets and is harassed, weird way of putting it, his uncle, One-Eye, Aemon. Aemon loses control of his dragon, Vagar, who kills Lucheris. Daemon informs Rhaenyra of her son's death. And I think the last line is something like, this means war. So we're expecting all-out war for season two, right? And I think, sadly to say, we did not get that. So, first off, I will say I was mildly disappointed for a number of reasons. Because despite being one of HBO's flagship shows, we had two less episodes in season one. They did blame it on the right strikes. And bar episode four is A Dance of Dragons, which clearly sucked up the whole budget for the season. Pretty much the whole season was people in rooms talking. And yes, I can already hear David saying, but that's what Game of Thrones was when it was at its best. The problem is those conversations and characters are not as interesting as they were in Game of Thrones. What do we think? Do we agree? Or how do you, uh, Jose, what do you think first? I, I'd like to think in honor of the Olympics, this is my analogy. Um, you know how <laughs> the gymnast runs up to the thing to jump off and do a f- bunch of flips? Mm-hmm. We got cut off at the jump. <laughs> <laughs> I I honestly wasn't disappointed with the show. I actually enjoyed it. It was a great setup, but I think we were kind of robbed of a nice little payoff. There was that point where we found new writers from the bastards, basically. 
there was meant to be a big battle in the end. There was meant to be a big yeah. sea battle, uh, a sea battle, and there is a um, like the Battle of the Gullet, I believe it's called. Exactly, I was about to say David would be screaming uh. at us right now, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, because there is like that was meant to be planned, but because of budget restraints and the writer strike, it was cut. I also do agree with David. I don't mind talking, and I don't mind scheming in rooms. Scheming in rooms, not action-packed episodes, but it did go on for a very long time. And the percentage of season two was mainly meetings. I do agree with that. Mm. Uh, that being said, I still really, really like the show and I still did enjoy season two. It did still have so many great moments. It did have episode three, which had the most coolest dragon fight ever. Yes, but, uh, I really enjoyed Put to that. screen. That was good, and that had some really good holy shit moments. To be honest, I enjoyed episode four more because what I always loved about Game of Thrones is the fallout the next day, mm. that what happens after the big battle, and everyone mourning Renees in like different ways, and then big old twat of a guy. What, what's the new hand called? Oh, Christian Cole. Yeah. Him doing like the massive mistake of like parading a dragon's head through this town. That is like Ooh, one decision because yeah, like Game of Thrones is all about decisions and that everyone like seeing that was like, okay, that is a decision that will backfire in his fucking face and face like we all knew it. And also just like no one paying attention to the human sized box that they were also <laughs> wheeling in. Just yes, like, what yeah, a coincidence. Let's, exactly. Let's throw some but he was alive in it. it. Exactly. How long is he alive for this very slow march? As he was slowly dying of burns, he <laughs> would have stopped. They would have rushed him to it. Well, as Mustafa said in Austin Powers, I'm not. I'm not dead. I'm just very badly very burned. Badly burned. <laughs> that was I literally it. watched. I saw that the other night. Um, I was looking late night and I saw a bit of Austin Powers one. I was like, yeah, I'm going to watch. I think though, for me, the problem is there's too many characters that are not memorable in it, and too many characters whose names are not familiar. Oh, sorry, are familiar, are similar. And I similar. Struck, Everyone has yeah. the same name. I mean, that's to be honest, oh, the yeah. whole plot. I think that's the irony. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, but also that's kind of the whole plot of the um the book. The, yeah. the, the book everyone, because that was like I think it was episode two, uh, to the ending of episode two where Allison and Rainier uh, get together and discuss like, the final words, situation. uh, words, and Allison realizing that had that like. In this very moment, she knew she fucked up moment. <laughs> like, it's just like where it dawned on him. He's like, oh, wrong Aegon. Oopsies. I may uh, yeah. have started the civil war because I misunderstood my dying husband's last word. And just that moment where then she was just like, it's too late now. I I'm sticking to my guns. It was just, I was like, well, we this could have been avoided if you had different fucking names. Like... <laughs> Yeah. I mean, yeah, like I, I've got, I've got, I'm looking at it. I've got a little, my list of pros and cons. I'm kind of like half and half on the season. Mm -hmm. uh, the acting is still superb. Emma Darcy and Olivia Cook absolutely oh, kill their scenes together. Emma Darcy. And their two scenes, yeah, she's so good. They're both so, so good. good. And like you just mentioned, Marie, I love how Alison realizes she's cocked up and then she just wants to be rid of it all. I mean, she suggests like right at the end, I just want to run off and just leave them to it. I don't care anymore. And that mm -hmm. whole thing about being free and just going out into the field. Uh, Christian Cole, I love the fact he's become a duplicitous shitbag even more. Oh, I yes. cannot wait for him to get eaten by a dragon. And he's also shagged both queens now as well. Yeah. So he's definitely going right. to get murdered horribly. What a fucking hypocrite. <laughs> yeah, I, I was I was I was I was kind of sad at first. He's like, Oh, you're starting to be a douchebag. He's like, Nope, he went full douchebag. He went full and douche. He, he did he did a really good job at it. Like mm -hmm. they they really made you just be like Oh, you son of a bitch. Because he but, was yeah. a bit likable till he became jealous knobhead in season one. And then now he's just he was, full on yeah. knobhead in season two. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I love the idea that anyone with a trace of noble blood might be able to become a dragon rider. And Alan's of whole revelation it was, I mean, it was so telegraphed because every episode you keep seeing Callies down at the docks just hanging out with his obvious illegitimate sons. It was so uh, obvious there. Uh, Amond, you one eyed bastard. I love that he tried to kill his brother and immediately take control. I thought he was one of the highlights of the season. He was really good. Clubfoot, I feel like, had some good moments too. I was about to say, yeah, Laris and Aegon, two cripples adventure spin off next season. I love where I don't know where they're going, but I'd be much more interested in their storyline now. Uh, I'm yeah. here for it. And at the end of episode one, with the death of the child, was truly shocking. Oof. 
Nothing yeah. really reached those heights. And it wasn't, you didn't see it on screen. It was just the sound. That yeah. sound work at the end of episode one. We were like, holy shit. Also, they've introduced Freddie Fox, Spider from Slow Horses, as Alison's brother, who's never been mentioned before. At least I don't remember him being mentioned in season one. But I like his scenes with Sir Kristen, and I like that he could hopefully become more of a bigger character in later seasons. I mean, talking about gruesome sound designs, like, I mean, in season one, like in episode one, yes. But also in episode four, when they're taking the charred armor oh, off. Yeah. Oh, body. oh my <laughs> God. I was, I felt so sick. I felt so sick. Once again, they did not, I mean, they, there was some goo. There was some goo. A little bit of goo, not too yeah, much. Yeah, but we didn't see much. But that sound as well as they're like ripping melted metal off flesh. Oh, the sound design was yeah it was like really good and i love the soundtrack as well the soundtrack is really good yeah. and um i didn't uh mention this when we talked about episode one in, on a previous episode but i love the new opening with the tapestry yes yeah, yeah, yeah. as someone who's an embroidery nerd i just i <laughs> oh. love it so so much it is such a good one i love that it replaced the season one one because that wasn't that interesting but with this uh, with the game of thrones theme and like the tapestry being woven together i think that is such a nice touch but in in your recap neil i noticed that we we met, missed one plot point that that we I think all want to forget and I think just because it was so not memorable Ooh. but Ooh, I love this build up though I love him so much but Matt Smith's storyline in this one him just going cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs <laughs> in a castle for eight <laughs> episodes straight it just it, it went on too long Marie <laughs> you've literally have just mentioned the first on the top of my list of cons of this season. Why did we waste one of the best characters in the show, Masmus Damon, titting about at Harrenhal for the whole season, where he's clearly being drugged by the witch, and he's just neutered as a character? The amount of shit he took off the lords of Harrenhal. Season one, Damon, would have had their heads on spikes within five minutes of meeting them. It just, it made no sense. Like, and, like, I, I, I do, like, I do really enjoy watching the behind the scenes Mm, uh, yes, of how yes. they shot House of the Dragons. I do find it very fascinating. And then when they were Did talking... Did Matt Smith just want to stay in that country where it was filmed? And that was it. I, like, I no, don't oh. know. I don't know <laughs> that. But they were talking about the sequences and they were like, oh, we don't want the viewers to know it's a dream and maybe like uh, pay attention to the background. But I'm just like... We knew it was a dream every We knew time. it was a dream. Uh, but You know what was really interesting is when, long. when he talked to those guys and they're like, oh, we'd rather die. And then they turn their back to the dragon. And then they cut to a later moment where it's like, I didn't think they'd be so willing to die. And I'm like, oh, so he killed them. And then, no, nope. they're just standing they're right just, there. Yeah. I was just like, what? Where the fuck? Well, and his whole character arc was, I might betray her. No, actually, I'm not. That was it. That was his whole storyline <laughs> for the season. Uh, that uh, was and um, mommy issues. Oh, oh, oh. What? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, both, we both realized what, what that was at the same time. Yep. Um, where the fuck was Otto Hightower all season? Because we only see him once, and he's on the ship as a prisoner, I think, at the end of Yeah, he was a prisoner. In... So I, I, after a while, I started thinking, something's not right there. He is not just ignoring her. I, I knew that there was a reason that he wasn't responding. Again, it was just something we didn't get that could have been cleaned up a little bit better at the end, at least. You know, just, oh, where is he? Oh, we have to wait two years to figure this out too and that's the problem right uh, it's just too long a gap between the seasons six episodes is not enough to maintain you for two years no one gives a shit no one is going to remember also season one why did we start with chase at the wall and the starks that we're never going to see again and won't return all season what was the point of it literally was still almost remind people remember the wall remember the starks oh yeah you remember you like game of thrones yeah we're not going to show you any more of that we're just back to people in rooms talking I, I just I don't yeah I I agree with you but I also like uh, I think I said that when we were covering the episode first episode I was just like I don't want to go back to no. like the north and the wall because we know the threat there is not going to happen for like another like hundred years like we, the White Walkers aren't just around the corner like we can like focus on the Civil War yeah and like there was also no no like reason for him to like for a Stark to be there as well at the wall it was like yeah it was literally just like. Here's the big ice wall again. Yeah, it's oh, we got we, we got we got some CG we got some CGI wall left. Yeah, bung it in, tie it up a bit. <laughs> um, I think another complaint I have the show is it's still too serious. 
like the dialogue sparkles in Game of Thrones. You have it's not, you know, obviously, yeah, Tyrion is a funny character, but but all the characters had funny moments. You know, every character in Game of Thrones, the dialogue, it just it had funny moments. This is dark and tragic and mopey all the time. There's very little levity in it. Oh, I see. I agree with you, but I don't. I don't have a problem. Maybe because I'm dark, tragic, and mopey. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but now that you pointed that out, that is true. Like Game of Thrones does have some witty lines and does have oh, some yeah. wittiness, and this one is dark, dour, really. dour. No, it is. It's like if you had two hundred Jon Snow set around. This is what the show would be. Actually, that and that show that show got cancelled as well, didn't it? Before it even got out, because there was oh, an idea that oh, thank fuck, it did. Because we, what I was did it not... going to be? It was just going to be Jon Snow and his wolves hanging out, being miserable up north in the snow. Great, yeah, Let's yeah, watch yeah. That it, for, it's like, literally you know episodes. that gif that we like, like of him like just standing with all the snow, uh, snow around yeah. his face. <laughs> like it, it's yeah, no, it deserved to be cancelled. I think there was just so many things that didn't even get like barely addressed, like that girl who was in that castle that got kicked out. She spent the whole episode trying to find that wild dragon and then you just finally get that little bit at the end we're like oh okay and it's right alan there. of hole instead yeah it's alan of hole gets it i mean i did like alan of hole he was the only one he could like the other dragon riders were a bit underwhelming like the drunk guy and then the poor dad oh. I, liked the, I did like the poor dad i can't remember his name but i was like okay it's cool seeing the small folk in that battle for food like that mm -hmm. would like to see a bit more of that uh but again a bit more and the thing where they like take them all to see the dragons and they barbecue everyone and, and then they do it again despite not working the first time. But they telegraph it so you know they're not all gonna die the second time. Yeah. And you know but with the fact that both of them survived, I was like, okay. But then they all turn up for this big showdown at the end of episode seven. And then they it's just there's nothing in episode eight. It's just oh no, they're gone, that happened. There's a bit where Aemon goes off and like raises a whole village. No, that ha apparently that's described in a book. No, can't afford the budget off the screen this season. Yeah, and apparently they are doing the Battle of the Gullet, but they're going to open season three with it, is what I've mm -hmm. heard. Yeah, and then the rest of the season three will be boring. It'll be people in rooms talking or in ship. It'll be Otto every ten minutes. We'll have ten minutes of Otto in a in a hold, going somewhere on a boat for a whole season again, probably. Uh, oh. Having said that, I do like uh, that character, so you never know. Do you know what? <laughs> uh, I think this brings us close to the end here. I'm actually looking forward to at the minute the Rings of Power season two. Coming out in a couple of weeks, then I am. I'm more excited for that from the trailer that I've seen than I am for season three of House of the Dragon at this point. Oh, it wasn't that bad. It was. I. Uh, no, no, no. I'm not saying it's bad. Setup. I'm saying. I am saying it was just average. It was average. I for think. Me. I think it. Uh, what I'm hoping. What I'm hoping now. Let, let's <laughs> not. Um, Game of Thrones has stabbed me in the heart before. Uh, I like, and then they gave me hope with House of the Dragon. But also, didn't they say that they're finishing House of the Dragon with season four? Yeah, I, I think know. George R. R. Martin said that that's how, um, like how like long he thinks it would take to tell the full story of the Dance of Dragons. We'll see. I mean, the, the because like the the source material is way way thinner oh, than Game of Thrones. I, I gave up on that book. <laughs> I, I I tried. Um, I haven't read it, but all because but I know. That it's written as a history textbook, yeah. not as like a fantasy oh. novel like Game of Thrones is. It's like yeah. it's a history oh, wow. novel. So it's it's a tough read. Yeah, George R. R. Martin in general for me is a tough read. That's why I never uh, could continue with the uh, the actual series as well. Neither did he. Uh, he is I, I, <laughs> he is writing. There are sources saying that he is writing. I I'm going to defend the man. He's. I I started reading the first book when I started on ships. Uh, I'm still waiting. <laughs> but anyway so what what i was gonna say is like yes game of thrones has stabbed me in the heart before but what i'm hoping season two will be is would act like almost season like three? a prequel to season three and then oh, when okay. you watch it all together you're gonna go okay that was epic like i hopefully they're now gonna deliver on season three like we had all this build up we had all the exposition and now they can just deliver with season three. I'm really hoping that will that's what's going to happen. I think you've got more hope than me there, Marie. I think we're going to get an absolutely amazing first episode, which will be the big battle. I think the second one will be a really good follow-up one, like you always say, where they you have the aftermath of the battle. And then it's going to be people in rooms talking because of budget. And this is my big problem now with a lot of the shows. They, they, you, they throw all the money at it to get it on screen. And then they don't care about keeping shows going, sadly, anymore. How many shows even get to six or seven seasons now? Hardly any. 
that's a funny thing when you look at the Emmy nominations this year. It's all the big shows that used to win them have finished. So you're like, wait, Fallout's nominated for like 26. It's a great show. I enjoy it. I wouldn't put it up as like that level. I mean, Shogun will take everything this year, and rightly so. Oh, we haven't Shogun. talked about Shogun yet. Yeah, we have we not? Shogun we have is not. so good. We need to do an oh, episode wow. on Shogun. We'll be doing a Shogun one at some point, because I think it's going to be in our top 10 of the year list easy. One of the actresses literally cries when she gets interviewed about it. So it's It was so yeah. good. There so, we go. uh, Wait, <laughs> one <laughs> second. I, I had one more rant for the Umbrella Academy that I'm just going to slide in here. And Edit that... note for Neil. <laughs> no, no, no. We can end the show about the, uh, on this. The fa- secret societies having tattoos makes no oh. fucking sense. And invisible there. areas too, like the the FBI director. But so you can show them you're in a secret society. Ugh. <laughs> no That's sense. not secret. Did you just see hear what could, just came out of your mouth? That makes no sense. It's the same with the golden circle and like the Kingsman suck fest. That was the <sighs> sequel. Uh, <sighs> but there's no yeah. point in branding your secret society. There, we can end yeah. the episode now. My, my rant is out. <laughs> Makes sense. Right, well, that's all the time we have on this episode of the We Need Roads podcast. I'd like to thank my guest, Jose. Jose, are you off to train your dragon? Nope, that sounds wrong. Uh, Jose, where can people find you on socials? No, so go ahead and check it out. I mostly uh, portraits and uh, lifestyle shoots on my Instagram and on my website. You can see my wedding portfolio. And remember, um, and what's your and what's the address, Jose? Where can people find you? My website is www.jlopezphotos.com, not JLo. As we have to clarify every time now, it's a bit, it's a running bit. These are not pictures you have taken of Jennifer Lopez or Jennifer Lopez's many weddings, of which there'll be another one, I guess, in a couple of years now. I mean, it's just a matter of time now that she's divorcing Ben Affleck. For the second time. Sad, sad moment, you know. Sad Ben Affleck at Gibbs at the Ready. Marie, uh, where can people find you on the socials? Well, if you want to learn how to avoid the cleanse of our ever-warming planet, um, you can listen to my podcast called Two Girls, One Reusable Cup, uh, which is a podcast all about living a low-waste lifestyle in your 20s. You can also follow us on Instagram and Twitter. And if you want to follow me personally, I go by Life on Mars on all the interwebs. All of the interwebs. All of the interwebs. Twitter, TikTok, Instagram. And I'm off to hope no more period shows get cancelled before the end of this. We needed Rose.